Welcome everyone to our next webinar in our Learn at Home series brought to you by the University of Rhode Island Cooperative Extension and the College of the Environment and Life Sciences. Today we have an exciting program for you by Christina DiCenzo, who is our URI 4-H program coordinator. She's going to share some earth and energy science activities for youth that you can do at home with your kids to reinforce some concepts for summer learning. Um, this series, again, is brought to you by Cooperative Extension. We work to bring science-based university resources to Rhode Islanders, and we've done that for over 100 years. Um, these days, we focus on five what we call strategic areas of focus. Those are land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy efficiency, um, and healthy lifestyles. And this webinar in particular is probably going to focus in on that energy um, energy bucket there, which we're very excited about. So just to share one of our um, focuses for the coming years, we are um, committed to making sure that everyone in Rhode Island um, has access to science-based information to improve their quality of life and their livelihoods, and especially the health of our natural environments. And also, we are committed and believe in social justice. Um, and, and to that end, we're working really hard to make sure that this information is available to people from all walks of life. And one silver lining of the, the um, COVID-19 pandemic is that we can offer these educational workshops online so that they're accessible to folks um, without having to come somewhere. So very excited to share this information with you. And just a couple housekeeping items before I turn it over to Christina. Um, there is a brief survey at the end of the presentation that you'll receive in a link um, via a follow-up email, and we really appreciate you taking that survey and sharing um, information with us about what you learned through the webinar. Also, if you have friends and family and acquaintances who you know would be interested in, in this information for themselves, you can go to or send them the link to our Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. And this webinar and all of the others that we've offered through our Learn at Home series are Posted there, and they're also all closed caption um, once they're uploaded. So, again, thanks for taking the survey. Um, and without further ado, I introduce Christina DiCenzo to you to share. Perfect. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I am very excited to be here. Um, and as Kate may or may, may not have mentioned, I am having some technical difficulties on my end. So I, I understand that all of you can hear me, but for some reason I cannot hear anyone else. So it's going to feel a little weird for me, but, but we're going to dive right in. Um, so today we're going to talk about earth and energy science specifically for um, youth, right? So as Again, Kate may or may not have said, my name is Christina, and I am a 4-H program coordinator for the University of Rhode Island 4-H program. So um, we work with youth every day. And before um, I dive in a little bit more, I want to talk about what is 4-H. Um, oh, and and two, you know, I, I hope that, you know, um, you guys will want to be interactive. I don't want this to be so much of a lecture as much as a conversation. So. I will be watching the chat, and if at any point you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them in there. Um, I'll be asking you guys questions. So with that said, right, um, so I work at 4-H, and 4-H is actually a youth development program under the United States Department of Agriculture. So every university, or I should say one university in each of the 50 states has a 4-H program run out of it. So in Rhode Island, right, this is the University of Rhode Island. So I work through the university with the 4-H program. And 4-H program, it stands for Head, Heart, Hands, and Health. Because at 4-H, those are the four elements that we believe we need to foster in youth to create productive um, and, and contributing citizens, right? 
So before we get into this too, I want to ask, is there anyone in high school or younger on the call today? Or are we, we have mostly adults. And I'm going to look in the chat to see uh, if anyone is responding. Adults, okay. Okay, so we've got mostly adults today. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some really great earth and um, energy activities that we can do with our kids at home. And they're, they're hands on activities, they're really fun. Um, and at 4 H, we actually do a, a lot of science activities. If you have heard, H, heard of 4 H before, you probably associate us with animals and agriculture, especially farm animals, because those are the roots of 4 H. Um, and we still do a lot of work with animals. We have youth that raise animals, show them at fairs. We learn a good deal about veterinary science, but we also learn about other types of sciences. And we also learn about leadership and life skills through public speaking and mentoring programs. Uh, we have programs on healthy living, um, so physical fitness and emotional health. And then um, we also explore the arts through drawing and theater and painting. So we've got eggs in a lot of different baskets at 4-H. So, you know, with all that, why are we focusing specifically today on earth and energy sciences, right? Well, as we all know, right, there are so many uh, issues in today's world related to, to energy and to earth, whether it's um, clean, renewable energy sources, sources, climate change and global warming, um, pollution, and, and all of these issues are compounding and becoming increasingly urgent. And what's more of a problem is that ample research is showing that fewer youth than ever are choosing to pursue careers in the sciences. And this is obviously very problematic, right? Because we need up and coming generations to be part of the solutions to these problems. And so plenty of youth and probably plenty of adults, right, feel that they're not that tied into the sciences. Um, maybe they feel that science isn't for them. It, you know, it's just not their forte. They're not that interested in it. But I'm going to I'm going to guess that even if you think science isn't for you, you're more tied into science than you realize. Right? Because studies have shown that most Americans consume science based entertainment, be that through the news or social media, um, through literature or television. So if we think about maybe our average day watching television, right? How many doctor shows do we see? How many CSI crime scene investigation shows do we see? Right? And, and all of those shows are kind of sneakily teaching us scientific concepts, even if we don't really realize it, or that's not the primary reason we're consuming that entertainment. But science is prevalent um, everywhere. So it, it's really important that, that we teach our kids. And to do that, right, we need to make it fun. So science can be fun. Um, and, and some of the best ways we can make science fun are by, by uh, making science relatable, and one of my favorite ways to make science fun is by making it edible. That's my favorite. So I'm going to show you a couple edible science activities, again, that you can do right at home with everyday materials. So first, I want to talk to you about an activity called edible aquifers, right? And so first, we need to talk about what is an aquifer? And I'm sure that many of you on the call no right but when we're talking to kids it's so important that we let them draw the conclusions right so rather than saying well an aquifer is xyz we ask like what is an aquifer have you heard of a word that sounds like that aqua aquifer what do you think that is right and the conclusion we usually get is that it's something to do with water and that's right of course right so an aquifer is ooh, Hello, an aquifer is underground water. And uh, we know that aquifers are so important, right? Because they provide such a significant source of clean drinking water. And it's one thing to say that, right? But it's another thing to understand why that is. Why do aquifers contain such clean drinking water? And, and how do they keep the drinking water clean, right? So we can explore this concept by creating our very own 
um, version of an aquifer using all edible materials, right? So first we have to start by um, understanding some more scientific concepts, right? So in this picture here, you're seeing something called a soil pit. That's what a geologist would call it, right? So you dig down really deep into the soil and you can actually see all of these different strata in the soil, right? Up towards the top soil, we see this grayish layer, and underneath that, a, a reddish layer, underneath that, yellow. And then we go back to gray and brown. And all of those um, horizons, as a geologist would say, right? All of those layers have special chemical and physical properties that um, serve different purposes. And again, we can model this through food, which is fantastic. So the most important layer that we have to understand before we can start building it with food, right, is something called the confining layer of an aquifer. And, and most of the times confining layer means a layer of clay, right? So we can tell our kids if, if they're not familiar with what clay really looks like in the earth, they can imagine silly putty or they can imagine Play-Doh, right? And so you can see from this image, right? Even if you're not familiar with clay, you're probably familiar with those other materials I mentioned. And so you know that those materials and clay are, are um, soft and moist, but more importantly, they're dense. They're really, really thick. And we'll see why that is so important when we build our edible aquifer, because we'll see that the confining layer or the clay is key in keeping out all of the harmful chemicals like pesticides and um, runoff from animal waste that can sink into our drinking water and contaminate it. Okay, so now we get to the fun part where we actually get to build our edible aquifer. So we're gonna start off with just a plain plastic cup, okay? And then at the very bottom of the cup, we're gonna put in our aquifer. And we're gonna model that by using just some, some crushed ice or some ice cubes, right? That is our clean drinking water. So then also mixed in with our water, right, in that aquifer, we've got some dirt, we've got some rock, and we're gonna model that with some chocolate chips, okay? So on top of the chocolate chips, this is where we get into that clay, that confining layer. So we can ask our kids, or you can think about it right now too, what is a food that we could use that is thick and dense like clay is, right? And so we might get some guesses like peanut butter, um, or I had someone guess marshmallow fluff is sometimes pretty dense if you pack it down. But for the purposes of this aquifer, we're gonna use ice cream, okay? So that ice cream is gonna be like our clay, that thick layer that doesn't let too much permeate through it. All right, so then on top of that, we still have some more layers until we get to the top soil. Okay, so on top of the ice cream or the clay, we have a layer of gravel and we can model that by using something like cocoa puffs, right? Cocoa puffs are, are um, pretty loose. They let a lot of water permeate through. They're a good model for gravel. And then finally, we can get to our, our topsoil and you know we've got rocks and twigs and whatnot. So we'll, we'll uh, use a layer of chocolate sprinkles to model our topsoil, okay? So now that we have our aquifer all built up with all of its layers, right? We have to see that clay or that confining layer in action to really understand how it's protecting the drinking water. So what we'll do is we'll take some milk because that's what we need to top this Sunday off, right? Or you could also use water or soda or whatever else you wanna put in your aquifer. And we're gonna pour that in and watch the way that the milk or whatever other liquid trickles through those layers that we've created, right? So as you can imagine, in something like cocoa puffs, right, the milk is going to go right through. But when you get to that ice cream layer, you're going to see that lots of that milk, right, bubbles up because it can't get through. And a little bit will. A little bit is going to sink into your chocolate chips and, and your ice, right? And that's important to note because, right, some contaminants do get into aquifers. They do get into our drinking water, especially when there's a high volume of contam contaminants, right? But we can see that the clay is really doing its job and it's keeping most of the unwanted material out of the aquifer. So here are some completed edible aquifers using different materials. I think 
one of them, I think this has pudding as a confining layer, which is a, a good choice on the left. And on the right, you can see that someone added food coloring um, to water. And, and that's really great because then the color makes um, the water really pop. You can really trace it as it moves through your cup. And again, in the picture on the right, you can see, granted, you know, they just started pouring that water, but you can see that it's kind of going right through those crushed cookies that look really delicious. And it's kind of getting tripped up at the ice cream, right? So this is how we can see our aquifer in action. And if you wanted, of course, you could make your aquifer really complex with tons of different layers. Um, if you're really into soil science, or you can make it really simple, right? But the underlying concept is the same, that you have a thick layer, a confining layer that keeps your aquifer, the water in your aquifer clean. Okay, and this is awesome because not only is it an excuse to make and then eat a Sunday, right? But it's also exploring the why and the how of science, right? Because it's one thing to say that, well, this is, you know, aquifers have clean drinking water, but it's a totally different thing to understand why aquifers have clean drinking water. And exploring the why and the how, right, is how we're really going to teach kids and ingrain those lessons in them. And then, of course, who doesn't like to eat a Sunday, right? So, all right, so I'm going to move on to our next edible science activity, unless we have any questions, but I don't see any in the chat. So I think we are all set. But again, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, I don't like hearing myself talk for too long, so I don't know how you feel about it. But on to our next edible science course. Okay, so now I wanna to talk to you about something called a solar oven. And that is just like what it sounds, right? It is a solar powered oven that you can make just using a handful of everyday activities that you probably have in your home right now. So the key, the key um, material you need here, right, is a pizza box. Um, so first we're going to start to make our solar oven by cutting a flap in the top of our pizza box. Okay, so envision that you cut a rectangular flap, you can peel back and see inside your pizza box. Okay, and this is going to be the basis of our oven. So if we take a look here at a completed oven, we can see that they've done quite a bit more to it, right, than just cut a flap in the top. So Again, we want to ask our kids, you know, rather than telling them, do this, do this, do this, step one, step two, step three, we really always want to be thinking about why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? What does this do? Okay, so I want you guys to think critically about this too, right? So the first additional material we have in our solar pizza box, right, is a wooden dowel. It could be a pencil. It could be a ruler, anything that props that flap open, right? And then we have a layer of aluminum foil covering that flap. And so this is where we really want to engage our kids and say, okay, well, why would we put a layer of aluminum foil on our pizza box flap? Okay. And even if you look at this picture, right, you can see that in the bottom left-hand corner, you get a lot of light reflection, right? It's noticeably lighter. There's noticeably light reflecting off of the aluminum foil. So as you can imagine, uh, when sunlight hits the aluminum foil, it's bouncing off the foil and it's going right into the box, okay? So this is the basis of your solar energy, right? This is how you're gonna power your pizza box. And as an aside, I did hear that it's going to be almost 100 degrees this weekend into Monday. So if there's ever time to make a solar powered pizza box, it is this weekend, you definitely have to try it out. And the hotter it is, obviously, the better you're going to cook things inside your pizza box. So once you cover your, your flap with aluminum, right, you're going to stretch a layer of thin plastic wrap over the top of your pizza box, right? And again, we constantly want to be thinking about, okay, well, why would we do this? So what this strip of aluminum, or I'm sorry, what this strip of um, plastic wrap does is it traps the heat that's being reflected by the aluminum inside the box. And what this does is it mimics the greenhouse gas effect, right? So we have a layer of ozone in our atmosphere that 
allows sunlight, right, to come through. But then that sunlight, when it tries to bounce back, it can't get back through the ozone layer. So it lets heat in and then it traps it inside. And that is exactly what this film of plastic wrap is doing. So then finally, right, we want to add um, black construction paper to the very bottom of our box. So black, as we know, right, um, absorbs the most amount of light. So this is going to act as a heat sink, okay, and it's going to make the box extra hot, as hot as possible. So between all these different elements, you will build up enough heat to cook s'mores, to cook cheese quesadillas, to cook pizza. And the best part is kids are going to do this and, you know, you could do this activity and not even be thinking about science. You're just thinking about making lunch, right? But we find these sneaky ways to incorporate science into really fun um, food-based activities. Uh, because who among us is not motivated by food, right? So you can make s'mores, you can make all sorts of treats. And again, I highly recommend you try it this weekend. The, the weather is going to be absolutely perfect for it. So. Let's move on and talk about our final edible activity. Okay, and to do this, we have to explore the 10% law of energy. So if you are not familiar with the 10% law of energy, right? It states that every time energy moves up a trophic level, 90% of the energy is lost. Okay, so to understand this definition, first we have to understand what a trophic level is. So, if we look at this food pyramid in front of us, right, each uh, bar, each different colored stripe is a trophic level. And what that means is it's just a, a link in the food chain. Okay, so every time energy moves through a link in the food chain, 90% of it is lost. So again, the first thing we want to ask our kids, constantly thinking about that why, constantly thinking about that how is, okay, well, where does 90% of that energy go? How do we lose 90%? That seems like a lot, right? And so 90% of that energy is lost as thermal energy. It's lost as heat, right? And so this is kind of maybe hard to imagine for some of us. And there is a plane going over my house. So I apologize if you can hear some background noise. But um, right, this is kind of hard to imagine that 90% of, of food energy would be lost in, in transit. So a way that we can envision this, right, is we can ask kids, okay, well, put a hand to any part of your body and you will feel hot to the touch, right? But that's because you're constantly giving off heat as your body undergoes its metabolic processes. Heat is a byproduct of much of life, right? So many things give off heat. Heat is unusable for biological systems, meaning we can't use heat to do any of the metabolic processes that we need to survive, right? We can't use heat energy. So heat is given off and then it's gone and it's no longer part of the food pyramid. But 10% of that energy does remain usable for us, okay? So this is kind of, this is a, a complex biological concept. Um, I did not encounter the 10% law of energy until I was in college. It's collegiate level material, but we can pare this down and make it really understandable for kids. And naturally we're gonna use food. I, there aren't many points in my life where I'm not using food. So the first thing we're gonna do, right, to make this a, um, a youth activity is we're gonna pare down our food pyramid and we're gonna eliminate a lot of steps and we're gonna say, okay, at the bottom of our food pyramid is grass, we're going to say that vegetarians eat the grass. We're going to say that meat eaters eat the vegetarians. You know, if your kid thinks, okay, well, a vegetarian is a person, you might want to specify that, you know, we're not talking about someone eating people, vegetarians. Um, we're talking about, you know, animals, other animals that eat grass. So once we have this food pyramid down, right, let's ask our kids in your mind, Pick whether you're a vegetarian or a meat eater. Flip a coin, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Some way, pick which one you are. And then don't say the answer, but keep it in your head, okay? So if we've got a classroom of kids or if we've got a small group, hopefully about half of them will be vegetarians, half of them will be meat eaters. So then we'll say, all right, let's get rid of this grass. 
and let's put Skittles in instead, okay? And let's say that we have 100 Skittles. And we don't have to say that we have 100 Skittles. We can actually have 100 Skittles. Let's put a basket of 100 Skittles in front of us. And okay, so all the vegetarians in the room, right? You get 10% of the 100 Skittles. So we get to say, okay, well, how many is that, right? What's 10% of 100? So our vegetarians get to go up to that pile of Skittles and they get to take 10 Skittles or 10% out of that pile. And now we say, all right, meat eaters, you don't get to go straight to the Skittle pile. That's not your food. You get to go to the vegetarian pile and you get to take 10% of those Skittles. That is your food, right? 90% is lost as heat, you take your 10%. So my meat eaters, how many Skittles are you gonna get? And the answer, which they will be very upset about, is one Skittle, okay? So now let's say that a big scary bear comes along and eats one of our meat eaters. How many Skittles is that bear gonna get, right? And so let's think of what is 10% of one Skittle that bear is going to get one-tenth of a Skittle. And that animation looks more like a half. But you're going to get the little tiny snippet of that Skittle. So then what we can do is we can ask our kids, okay, well, according to the 10% law of energy, do you want to be a vegetarian or do you want to be a meat eater? What is going to get you the most Skittles? What is going to get you the most energy? So then we understand, okay, you know, energy is not so much a, a, a abstract concept anymore, right? Energy can be quantified in these Skittles. And I know that I want the most Skittles possible. I know how to be energy efficient. Okay, so again, we can make this, this pretty complex topic pared down and suitable for young children. And if we have older children, right, we can make this topic applicable for them too. And the way that we do that is we, we make more complicated application questions, all right? So rather than just saying, do you wanna be a vegetarian or do you wanna be a meat eater? We can ask them, well, using the 10% law of energy, explain to me why a plant-based diet is more energy efficient, right? Explain to me why there are fewer apex predators or animals at the very top, right, of the food pyramid. Why are there so few of them? How does what we just learned explain that? Right, so the way that we adapt this, this activity and all of our previous activities is we use application questions to take what we've learned a step further. And if we're not there yet, if some of our kids aren't there yet, that's fine. Then we stick to the more basic application question. But we can adapt this to whatever skill set, whatever experience, whatever age level that we need to. All right, so. Contrary to what I may have made you believe in this presentation, not all science engagement activities need to involve food, but there are some unifying elements that all good science communication should include, right? So first of all, we know that kids move, right? We know that kids cannot sit still. So we wanna include movement in our activities as much as possible. So let's think back to our Skittle activity, right? I'm gonna keep the Skittles at the front of the room. You can skip your way up to them and you can jog back, right? I want you running, I want you moving because when your bodies are engaged, your mind is not gonna wander as much, especially for our smaller children. The more that they can stand, move, use their hands, use their legs, um, the more they're gonna be paying attention because they're not going to be shaking in their seat, just waiting till the second that they can pop up and run around, right? And this is actually true for adults as well. Uh, we forget that as we get older, we, we still don't really like to sit down for hours at a time, right? So even if you're adapting some of these activities for adults, you still wanna incorporate some movement um, because adults really get a lot out of that as well. The other thing we know about children and science communication is that our activities need to be hands-on. Right, and again, that has to do with engaging the body as well as the mind. Um, we want our kids to touch, we want our kids to build, because we know that in doing this, we're ingraining those scientific concept, concepts even further into their minds. And so while you may be 
pretty familiar with with the idea that you know of course kids need to move of course kids need to touch things right something we don't always think as much about is that we want our kids to have some level of control over that activity because i can come into a classroom and i can say okay this is what we're learning today and they might sigh they might be like oh i really don't care about this but if i come into a classroom and i say okay what do you want to learn today right? Their interest is going to be peaked. They're, they have stuff that they want to learn about. It may not be the same stuff I want to teach them, right? But if I really think about it, I can probably adapt my lessons to include elements of what they're already interested in, right? And in doing so, I'm letting them have some control over where this lesson is going. And the more control they have over the lesson, the more invested they're going to be in it. So as much as you can, you want your activities to be youth driven. You want to let them choose their activities, choose their topics as much as possible. Okay, and again, this, this completely holds true for adults as well. Um, and I'm sure many of us are familiar with it, you know, in our adult life, when we get some say over what we're going to be doing, right? It's much less of a burden and it becomes more fun. And that's certainly true of children as well. And finally, right, we want our science activities to be sustained. Um, again, if, if you talk to kids about the 10% law of energy, as I just did to you for about 10 minutes, they're going to forget it by the time they walk out the door, right? It was cool. We ate some Skittles. She said something about energy and, and then we left, um, right? But, if, but to build relationships with our kids, to build relationships between our kids and science, right? We need our efforts at education to be sustained. We need to um, have continual science learning or else, you know, we, we just don't make the same impact that we would otherwise. And so finally, I wanna to talk to you about something called open-ended exhibits. Right, and what an open-ended exhibit means is an activity with no one outcome. Okay, so science is typically very dominated by superlatives. So if you go into a classroom or you look up some science curriculum, you'll likely see instructions to build the tallest tower, um, build the fastest car, build a catapult that launches this marshmallow four feet. Right, and the instructions are very exact, and very precise, right? And, and that really doesn't leave much room for creativity um, because we've, we've already told the kids exactly what they should be doing. So as much as possible, especially when it comes to science, we really want to offer kids creative, critical thinking problems. Um, for instance, right, I, I can talk all day long about uh, evolutionary adaptations. I can lecture and I can say animals are adapted to be fit for their environments. But I could also say, okay, imagine um, a fairy tale world, right? The fairy tale world can be anything you want it to be. Now I want you to imagine an animal that lives in that world, right? And I want you to build out of popsicle sticks and googly eyes. Um, your very own imaginary animal. And I want you to tell me how it lives in that fairy tale world that you've created for it, right? And so when you do this, there's no pressure to get a right answer because there is no right answer. There's no pressure to have um, a construction that's better than someone else's, right? Because there's there's no sort of rubric for this assignment. So. Anytime that we can offer kids something to do that's creative, not only are we building those creative capacities, but we're also inspiring a lot more interest in, in what we're talking about. And so I'll give you another example, right? Um, if we give kids some materials, if we say we give them some tubes and we give them some balls, and rather than say build a ramp, we say, hey, create something with this. The results that you're going to see are amazing, what kids come up with. But what research has shown, right, is if we ask adults to do the same thing, here are your materials, make something, they don't know what to do. They, they, they say, well, what do you mean? What am I supposed to make? What are you looking for? And they, their imagination has been stifled, right, over time. 
through this very specific education and they no longer have the creative capacity that kids naturally do. So again, more than just encouraging creative capacity, we're building interest in the topic. And when we do this, we actually don't have to teach as much, right? Because the kids are going to want to know more themselves. They're going to go look something up if they didn't understand it. They're going to go look up further readings because now they're actually interested in what they're doing. And then it makes our job as educators easier because we no longer have to fight so hard to engage our kids in a lesson. So I can't speak highly enough about open ended exhibits. Um, there's a lot of great research that I would be happy to share on the efficacy of open ended exhibits um, and how they build um, creativity and and interest in science. It's really great. So at 4-H, right, we do try to work in these elements of effective science communication into our projects and activities. And I wanna share with you one such activity that I think really exemplifies what we've been talking about. And this is actually the Teen Science Cafe that is offered through 4-H. And in the Teen Science Cafe, kids meet uh, once a month. So right there, we have the sustained part, right? They meet once a month and they choose topics related to science that they want to learn about. And then they actually choose speakers they want to hear explain those topics. So for instance, our kids last month really wanted to learn about botany. Um, they took a vote, they, they threw out different topics, they took a vote to see what the crowd wanted to learn. It was botany. They contacted a speaker that they really liked, emailed the speaker, got them to come and share their experience. Um, and so in that way, right, they had total autonomy over what they were learning. They, they identified a subject they were interested in, they pursued it and they learned about it all on their own, right? And of course, you know, last month this was distance learning, so it wasn't quite our usual teen science cafe, but at most cafes, we have a hands-on activity. So um, we've had engineers come and ask kids to help create buildings with them. Um, our botanist had planned on um, bringing different leaf samples in and teaching the kids how to identify them if we were able to meet in person, which of course we weren't, right? So there's that hands-on element, right? And then we also allow the kids to move. We know that they're not gonna sit through an entire uh, two hour cafe, right? So they're allowed to eat, you know, they bring dinner, they all bring um, meals, they have a potluck dinner, so they stand up, they socialize with each other, they walk around, they eat, they sit down, they listen to the speaker for a little bit, and then they stand back up again and do a hands-on activity, right? So we get all of those four key elements that are really critical to science engagement. We have the movement, we have hands-on activities, um, we have autonomy or audience-driven lessons, and we have um, sustained engagement over time, right? And so I hope that going forward, uh, you will incorporate some of these elements right into your own science learning. And please, if you want to learn more, uh, visit the 4-H website. We have lots and lots of science resources, curriculum, projects, um, everything from building your own solar-powered robots to um, how to interpret tree rings to forensic science, right? Again, we've got our eggs in lots of different baskets. So um, I hope that you'll consider uh, taking advantage of some of those resources and trying these activities with your kids at home. Um, more, it's more important than ever, right, that we give our children hands-on experience in the digital age. It felt very weird to me today to be uh, emphasizing to you so strongly the importance of being hands-on when, when, when we're talking, you know, through a screen. So it's great um, if kids, if you can give your kids that experience. So again, please stay in touch. Visit the 4-H website, check us out on Facebook and Instagram, and please, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to email me or get in contact at any time. So uh, I see that there aren't any questions, so if you think of any, please ask, but if not, I will turn it back over to Kate, who has a little bit more to say uh, before we convene today. 
Thank you, Christina. That was excellent. Um, I do have a couple more slides just to show. So one thing, um, if you're interested in teaching youth, um, sharing these science-based activities with youth, which were very um, interesting to see as an educator myself, um, just the thought that went in behind them, and I might make an aquifer later today. Um, but we have a program called the Master Gardener Program, if you're not familiar, and each spring we train new folks beginning in January until April on horticulture and agricultural topics and then um, empower folks to go out and teach others in their community and that could be kids or um, you know, folks in the peer group as adults. So we would encourage you, if you'd like to learn more about being an extension volunteer through the Master Gardener program to check that out. And as Christina said, um, check out the 4-H website for more activities and also ways to engage with 4-H clubs around Rhode Island. Great opportunities there for all. And just to wrap us up here, I wanted to share some resources for everyone that are available online at that URL under online gardening resources. There is a ton of stuff um, to help folks grow their own food or attract pollinators or engage kids in garden spaces. And then if you have questions about your um, home landscape, and you want to send them in and an attempt to get an answer if you have a pest or disease problem or an identification question you can email photographs to gardener at uri.edu um, that email address is there for you you can join us for these webinars every uh, friday at noon and probably in the fall at tuesdays at seven of course we have our youtube page where the videos are posted and you can always call or email us so thank you again to everyone who joined i'm sure we'll have even more viewers when this is uploaded to youtube and until then um remember uri cooperative extension uh as your access point to exciting scientific research findings and thanks for being a friend be well thank you